Hello and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We're glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may be triggering or emotionally challenging. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us on this journey. Please note, your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of the screen for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas and YouTube within a week of this event. Here is a quick reminder of the Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat, Q&A feature, closed caption, and leave buttons at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. Now I would like to introduce Kate Crow, our moderator for this session. Thank you so much, Mari. Um, I'm going to briefly share my screen, not briefly, I'm going to share my screen for the duration of this uh, presentation. And um, uh, hopefully our, um, the project's founder, Dr. Joseph is gonna be able to join us. Uh, I think she's having some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna, uh, do a little bit of an introduction, um, and hopefully Dr. Joseph can uh, weigh in later if I miss something. Um, so I do want to um, give give a little bit of an overview of the Seeking Grace project, um, what it is, um, what where it came from, uh, and uh, where where it has um, ended up in the last kind of couple of years and since its inception in 2013. Uh, and all of the participants are going to introduce ourselves as we start speaking. So, um, hi, I'm Kate Crow. I'm the curator of Special Collections and Archives. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I identify as white. And uh, so we're going to be talking today about Seeking Grace, uh, the Seeking Grace Project. So um, just some, some brief history, and then the, the researchers are going to um, share more about their own um, uh, input and, and role in the project. So in 2013, uh, Dr. Nicole Joseph, who uh, is now a faculty member at Vanderbilt, um, but was at Here, DU Kate. at the time. Yes. Sorry. Oh, there she is, Dr. Issues. Joseph. <laughs> you are, but you're here. Yes, thank I'm you. I'm so excited. All right, I'm gonna, I'll shut up and let you talk about the inception of the project then. Go for it. Hi, everybody. Sorry uh, about being late. I had internet issues. Um, so um, as Kate was beginning to, talk about, um, we started the sister network <clears throat> um, at the University of Denver. And um, the um, Seeking Grace project originally, you know, just started with me, you know, asking Kate, you know, what would it look like to go back and discover like who were the first black women to, you know, graduate from this institution. Of course, that emerges out of my own work, just um, studying black women broadly. And um, we kind of you know, figured out, well, let's think about this and let's do it. Um, I had just come off of a project exploring the um, education, math education, particularly of black people at um, 25 historically black colleges and universities in their archives. And so uh, that was another sort of impetus for why I wanted to, you know, do this work. Um, and this is so wonderful to actually see that um, Kate decided to continue it as part of her, I believe it was your sabbatical, Kate, to continue the work and then to just see it grow even further. Um, and so to see the um, Black women that have taken up this work 
and to see where it is now um, as a um, mobile exhibit, I think it is, um, is just wonderful. So I am excited um, to uh, be here and I'm excited to just celebrate um, <clears throat> the early black women from Denver, as well as the current, you know, folks that have been working on this project. And Kate, is that enough? <laughs> I think that's great. And I think um, we will probably hopefully have some questions at the Q&A if, if folks want to know more about the inception. So um, so in and correct me if I'm wrong about any of these dates, I believe in 2015, Dr. Joseph accepted a position at Vanderbilt and um, the project went into a little bit of a, um, a dormant phase, I guess. Um, but before before uh, that happened, we were able to complete two oral histories with um, Ms. Beverly Lilly and Ms. Lana Ellington. And you see um, Ms. Ellington uh, with Dr. Joseph here in the slide. Um, and then um, after Dr. Joseph accepted the position at Vanderbilt, I, I really wanted, I didn't want the project to just sort of die on the vine. I wanted it to continue to grow. Um, and so uh, I decided to make my sabbatical research around um, Black alumni pre-1945, mostly because I didn't feel like I could realistically in 10 weeks get uh, further than that. And that resulted in a physical exhibition, which um, we did an event uh, with the SISA Network, um, which was uh, is a group founded by, co-founded by Dr. Joseph and um, uh, Anthea uh, Ruin Johnson um, on uh, to, to specifically support um, Black women in graduate programs at DU. Um, and so that was sort of the birth of the next phase of the project. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Liz and Patrice to talk about um, their work as researchers on the, this next phase. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrice Green. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, as Kate just stated, the next few moments are going to be about Liz and I sharing our experiences together working here um, as part of the research team. Both Liz and I, um, we worked a part of the research team from 2018 to 2019 during the second year of our master's program in the higher ed department here at University of Denver. Um, as I'm sure you will hear from other members of this current team, the research project, the Black alumni we interviewed and the Black women we worked alongside um, were some of our highlights at our time here at DU. Um, so for the next few moments, we're going to capture how the project provided a space to engage in research in a meaningful way when DU wasn't this utopia, utopia that was outwardly um, supportive of Black women. Um, we talk about graph background context of the team and how it has shifted and changed. And then last, we'll talk about the process of finding ourselves through the research process with each other and also why we we'll, uh, while we interviewed the participants. So much like the dialogic process and emotionality aspects featured in Black Feminist Thought, we're going to engage in this section of the presentation today in a more relaxed conversational space between Liz and I and of course everyone that here today. Uh, so to kick it off, Liz is going to start about how the project provided the space to engage in research in a meaningful way. All right, so when thinking about space, majority of the time, I found myself in spaces where I was the few. And thinking about the notion of diversity and what that looks like, I wanted to move towards spaces where I could find community. So thinking about this project, it allowed me to find community um, with a group of Black female scholars, Patrice and Kylia. Um, collaboration of the knowledge with these two ladies brought this um, and with this project created a platform um, to connect with um, a group of women that I identified with. So the work experience was very purposeful and I found that I enjoyed how we connected and worked together. Um, we all come from different experiences and those experiences helped to share how we learned and engaged. Um, I felt like as a team, we could do anything and master through any issues that came our way. And it was a way to connect and learn about Black women and listen to their stories that were told by Black women. Um, this project um, was a start. Um, of course, we already talked about the history of how this project started. Um, but just thinking about the inspiration from um, Dr. Joseph, who took the first step to not only tell the story of the first, but also to go beyond that. Um, this project was a way to, um, it's very meaningful and necessary regarding the historical context of the university. 
similar to what Liz is saying, um, I also have to say that I'm grateful for the space and the memories that we've been able to create with the women on the research team. Um, I remember when Liz, Kalia, and I worked together, um, it was just a very intentional space of support and community um, that we created for one another, not only in this project, but we were all members of the same program. Um, we were consistently around one another, encouraging each other, venting to one another, being vulnerable with one another in this space, but also holding ourselves committed to the goals of the project, which meant interviewing women from different generations from DU, getting the IRB, presenting and advocating for funding for this project. Similar to Liz, um, I saw this project as a way to connect with Black women that were currently and formerly at DU and reflect on the legacy that Black women such as Grace Mabel Andrews have left on this campus. I also appreciated that this was an oral history project. Um, so we were talking in ways that were authentic to ourselves as Black women into the Black community. Um, and so it was just a pivotal time I'm really um, one of the highlights of my time here at DU. And to kind of just talk a little bit more about the context of the research team and kind of how it shifted and changed, Dr. Nicole Joseph um, and Kate shared uh, a little bit of the background in the early stages. And I would say after Kate went on her sabbatical, me and Liz, I guess if we're going to do like a, a timeline of sorts, maybe we're like in the middle of this. Um, and so the spring of my first year at DU, I remember there was a program exhibit um, reveal for Seeking Grace at the library. Though I didn't attend the event, it was the first time I had heard of the project. As my first year was ending, I I kind of had the idea that I want to get more familiar with research. I want to say I was at a meeting or program on campus where another Black woman, um, Anthea, told me about the project and connected me with the university archivist, Kate, um, who had been working on the project uh, with uh, Dr. Joseph Pryor. And uh, Liz and I were already great friends at the time. We had similar research interests. Um, and I remember telling her how amazing the project seemed to be. And I think Liz can probably share a little bit more um, from that point moving forward. Um, yeah, and as Patrice uh, mentioned, um, she introduced me to the experience. So I remember having a meeting with her and Kate. And based on the information that was provided, I was on board. So with that information, I found connection on how I could contribute to the project. So thinking about the research team, um, we first started um, with the archive stage. So we were looking up information on deceased Black uh, female alumni. And with that, we wanted to expand the knowledge to um, the oral histories with those that were currently alive. So going beyond the first and the deceased um, led to the want to connect those experience. So finding connection. Um, so with that, we found connections of generations and timeframes. And this created the notion that we, um, this created and connected to what we were currently experiencing within the community of DU which um, is special and unique. And along with that, we were able to, to travel to a conference in New Orleans and detail the experience of black women in connection with black feminist thought and critical race theory. And also during that time, we felt like phenomenology methodology made the best sense. I think the only thing I kind of want to add to that is, um, and Liz already mentioned, but there was kind of a shift in the project to include more recent graduates. So that was a huge undertaking, but one that I can probably speak for all of us that we were very proud to be a part of. It was really amazing to um, see Black women's history on campus start from the early 1900s with Andrews and then expand to all the way to 2019 uh, when we graduated. And we are looking at over a century's worth of history here. So history that uh, that though DU might try to diminish or this might not be highlighted all the time, it's history that's here and it's everlasting. Um, it's the story of Black women who are activists, they're scholars, they're mothers, they're students, um, they're, they're vocal leaders um, about calling out injustice, right? Not just here on campus, but maybe in society as well. And so they have all paid the way for me, for every Black woman that's here on this research team. Um, so it's amazing to be a part of something like this because you can directly see how hopefully your involvement with sharing and highlighting these stories uh, will continue on this campus at DU for um, long to come. And then thinking about the third question, how different, um, how we found ourselves through this project. Um, connecting back to the methodology of phenomenology, that's the main goal is to find that one thing that connects the group. And in doing this work, we were able to find the one thing that connected um, the experiences of Black women at DU. And this kind of led to my notion of self, thinking about self and how each one of us are different and how we experience different, how we experience things differently. Um, I feel like the interviews provided details on the experiences of Black women and their persistence at predominantly white institutions. They were able to find self 
myself and navigate through different things like racism, sexism, and feeling of being alone. So listening to their story, I felt like I found connection of myself and my experience at the same university. It was just powerful to hear the stories. It just makes me think of, um, of different ideas of what one does and what they do. Um, the journey that we had to navigate through, yes, it was hard. Yes, there were moments where we were upset. Yes, there was moments where we felt like we needed some healing, but overall, just thinking about the experience, it was a journey that was well worth it because I felt like, and I realized like we weren't walking that journey along and realizing that the purpose was bigger than us um, and how that work has led to us working in, um, with future generations. Yeah, so I can definitely echo a lot of what Liz has been saying. Um, my time on the research team definitely led me to find myself in multiple ways. I think one, just hearing the stories of racism and sexism that Black women face on this campus, I'm sure, I'm sure still face on this campus, right, was emotional. And to be honest, quite overwhelming at times when you're facing it yourself in real time. Um, so they weren't just stories that we had no connection to. Um, for me, it was like we were a living embodiment of every single participant in the stories they shared. I think a lot of times when um, Black women attend PWIs, there may be like this sense of isolation. Um, that's your alone. But let me tell you, when I, I think about Liz and Kalia, and I even think about Rachel, who's on the, the team now, we were uh, friends before Rachel started working on the project. Project. Um, but these are Black women who I know are going to be by my side, hold me accountable, and encourage me to advocate not only for myself, but for others. Um, so yes, I could sit here and I can say I gained all these research skills, which are important, and they led me to like where I am today. Um, but I think for me, uh, finding myself also led me to like finding and being solidified within a sisterhood here at um, DU, and I'm very grateful for that part of the opportunity. Yeah, and I, I feel like Patrice said that very beautifully. I just wanted to add, um, saying things out loud that words of affirmation, like to help say like, you know, we're not alone, we can do this work, we are necessary to push through and to continue the work really helped. And just even thinking about now where we are currently within um, PhD programs, future PhD programs, we continue to push through and realize the uh, impact that this work has had. So with the um, final question, just thinking about self once again, how that relate to the research team, but then also realizing how finding self connected to the narratives of black women who attended DU. Um, just, I found myself coming back to the notion of purpose. Like what is our purpose? This project made me think about um, how great black women are and where we've come from and the sacrifices that we have made for the future generations and so on and so on. So I feel like it was very important that the knowledge from um, the minds of a black woman, it should be acknowledged and taught. So just going back to this notion of diversity, of course, physical diversity is important, but at the same time, diversity also includes curriculum and what and what that looks like. Um, and just uh, to also be able to showcase our experiences is, is important. So just thinking about that notion kind of led me to where I am today with my education journey. So from the encouragement of the wonderful intelligent minds I had the chance to work with and those that I had the chance to interview, I found my purpose. I feel like I found myself. Um, this led me to work to continue on to tell the stories of Black women everywhere I go because I believe our stories are important and they matter. Um, and I've, I feel like this has already been said, but we are often silenced and left out. So I believe it's up to us to tell our stories. Yeah, um, similar to that, I think it's kind of hard for me to sit here and not connect this back to the stories and the oral history like of my own family and my own purpose. Um, so my mom didn't attend DU, but she was the first uh, in her family to attend college, a black woman at a predominantly white institution in the 70s. So her story, though, in a different decade, a different part of the country, in a different field, is kind of eerily similar to a lot of the stories that black women experience here at DU from the beginning to the present day. To me, that just highlights the significance of this project and why every campus needs something like this um, from taking historical perspectives and higher ed class this summer and for working on this project I think we saw how black women's perspectives are oftentimes hidden from stories universities or um, from archives that are shared so universities may often want to share pretty pristine immaculate stories and pictures not the raw emotion of what's what it's like being a Black woman um, in society, but specifically on campus. Um, similar to what Liz was saying, uh, the 
rapport that we had together as a research team and even like listening to the participant stories um, currently in my doctoral program and led me to what I'm studying now, which is how black women um, find community support amongst each other at predominantly white institutions. Um, so by finding myself, I was truly able to connect the dots of the experiences um, that we face. And like Liz shared, our stories matter and it's our duty and our responsibility to uphold the legacies of black women before us. And in closing, um, those are our thoughts. Thank you um, to the current research team again. We can't say how much this experience has provided knowledge and we're thankful to have had the opportunity to contribute to this work. I believe we are now passing it off to Rachel. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, I tried to turn my video off, but let's see here. Okay. I think, I think we're on. I hope y'all can see me on your end. Um, but let's see here. My name is Rachel Taylor and I currently serve as a COSI grant coordinator and student counselor at Colorado State University, Fort Collins. Um, welcome to everyone. It's great to see you all today. Um, thank you to Patrice and Liz um, for sharing more about your experience um, as being part of the research team. Um, a little bit about me. I had the opportunity to join the research team for the Seeking Grace project during the last year of my higher education program at the University of Denver. So for me, that would have been the 2019 to the 2020 academic year. And um, really um, my entryway into the project, the first time I remember hearing about it and learning about it um, was through Patrice and Kalia um, as they already had been part of serving on the research team. And additionally, we were all um, in the same master's program at that time. And so um, for me personally, I studied history and women's studies um, during my undergraduate career. Um, and this really, for me, felt like a great opportunity to um, dive into research and also really um, bring together um, history, which is super important to me, women's studies and also higher education. And so um, really all of those were coming full circle for me at that time during my master's program. And really for this slide, I wanted to take some time to dive into the connections that have been interesting to make between the Seeking Grace Project, um, Black Feminist Thought, and Qualitative Research as well. And so a lot of what I'll be sharing comes from an article called Black Feminist Thought and Qualitative Research in Education by Crystal Moore Clemens. And so the first point I really wanted to take some time to highlight um, and explore is on um, Black Feminist Thought and Qualitative Research itself. And so um, in this article, Clemen shares that Black feminist thought and qualitative research in education is guided by a particular understanding of the learning strategies informed by Black women's historical experiences with race, gender, and class. And so to me, this point was really important to share and highlight um, on the topic of qualitative research because Many parts of the Seeking Grace project included taking time to further explore the narratives of different Black women who were being interviewed throughout the project. Um, so for me, during my time on the research team, that was really taking time to actually um, go through already uploaded um, files of the interviews and really um, spending a lot of um, time going through and listening to them. And so I know that one example of learning strategies that were utilized are the questions that were asked during the interview. So thinking about the previous um, research team and like what questions can really be highlighted to really bring out um, those learning strategies that'll highlight historical experiences with race, gender, and class. Um, and a lot of those also brought out experiences that highlighted childhood, family, the University of Denver, and also the larger Denver community as well, um, which then could be um, tied and woven into thinking about um, race, gender, and class as well. And um, more specifically, when we think about the story of Grace Mabel Andrews, um, the second black female graduate from DU, we know that she was born in Missouri in 1886. She made the trip to Denver around 1905 with her family so she could pursue her bachelor's degree um, and that she used her degree to teach students in both Tulsa and Kansas City um, 
also recognizing she witnessed the devastation of the Tulsa race riots and returned to Denver to share her experiences with members of her church community. Um, so we can use the experience of Grace Mebo Andrews to really demonstrate how Black feminist thought and the historical experiences with race, gender, and class um, have shown up in different ways throughout this project. Um, further, we know in this piece, Clemens also shares um, that fundamentally qualitative research is the quest to discover meaning with a particular narrative or story with particular concern to the nuances of the story to deepen meaning and understanding. Um, so throughout my time um, working on the research project, there were different ways I think we took time to discover meaning within the story shared um, through those who were interviewed for the project. And so for example, um, the current research team continued to engage in research to really think about like what Denver looked like throughout different time periods over um, probably the past century or so. And so Kalia, Stevie, Kate and I, I remember we took some time and made trips to the Denver Public Library together and, you know, really spent a couple hours there um, going through books and other archival items as we continue to build on the stories and narrative that were highlighted interviews, um, which really allowed us to continue to um, take a peek at what life in Denver may have looked like throughout different time periods to really paint a fuller picture and create a backdrop um, for the Black women who were interviewed. Um, and moving forward, the last point I really wanna highlight is um, thinking about how qualitative researchers who utilize Black feminist thought are really challenged to organize a legitimate piece of work that could celebrate the work of women in their communities. So functioning as a critical ethnographic piece that is not exploitive and promote the further emancipation of black women. And so really for me, um, this quote highlights my personal thoughts and feelings about the Seeking Grace Project and getting to work as a research assistant on the project. So as a, um, prior MA student at DU, there were many times throughout the program where um, I saw how Black women and Black people had been caused harm and were navigating violent spaces, um, really in an attempt to continue their education. Um, but through the Seeking Grace Project, I have seen other Black researchers celebrate Black communities on the DU campus. Um, through this project, whether that is through panels, ongoing research, and even through the creation of the upcoming documentary, um, and really overall just highlighting um, um, Black history is part of DU's history. And so um, thank you all. I'm going to now pass it on to Kalia. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't see myself, but I am talking. Um, so hopefully you all can see me. Um, my name is Kalia Hunt Kabir. I am currently a racial equity consultant for Forever Riot um, LLC, which actually was founded in 2019 by myself, Patrice Green and Ozzy Alizium. Um, I say this to say that my roots with connections with black women at du uh run very deep and i would say it's all due in part to this work i have been on this project for three years now which seems like um, a lifetime in COVID times but i started um, this project my first year while I was in the higher ed master's program alongside Patrice and Liz um, and kind of have been seeing it through. Um, I will be talking more about like our pedagogical foundations um, and I will be going through critical race theory and kind of some of its ties to why archives should really be centered more. So we're just gonna go through the tenets like pretty quick and easy and then I'll transition a little bit. So some of the main tenets of critical race theory are that racism is endemic to American life. Um, it challenges the dominant ideology of race neutrality, objectivity, colorblindness, and meritocracy. 
It asserts that race has contributed to all manifestations of group advantage and disadvantage. So we're talking about the inequities there. It requires recognition of experiential knowledge of people of color. Critical race theory is, of course, interdisciplinary, and it strives to end racial oppression as a part of a broader goal to end all oppression. Um, I would say something that critical race theorists and my beloved professor Prof Tuid would always tell us is that like we start with race as our entry point to kind of see the connections between all of the other um, intersectionalities. And so I would say that the Seeking Grace Project and what we were doing with these narratives are a testament um, against the mainstream narratives of the University of Denver, which have historically eradicated the voices of Black women and those with other underrepresented identities. So I would say that when Dr. Joseph and Kate really got into Seeking Grace, they were doing that digging to show these narratives that they exist, right? And so um, they are there, but if we are in a space in which functions on white supremacy culture and white supremacist ideologies, we aren't able to see them. And so moving a little bit, and sorry, y'all, I'm talking fast. I normally talk fast, so let me just take a breath. Um, I would say that something that I really appreciate about this project as well as about critical race theory is really engaging counter narratives and using archives as a form of counter narrative storytelling. So I will explain kind of how we engage this on this project. So counter story is a method telling of stories of the people whose experiences aren't often told. Um, and those are the folks who are on the margins of society. Um, the counter story is also a tool for exposing, analyzing, and challenging the majoritarian stories of racial privilege. Counter stories can shatter complacency, challenge the dominant discourse on race, and further the struggle um, for racial reform. And so, as you can see, we have really engaged that um, with this project. And I think even taking it to another level um, with the documentary, um, it was kind of an idea that came to me while I was in South Africa pre-COVID. And I worked on some racial history type work. Um, and we made it into a documentary. Um, I think sometimes in the academy, we are used to writing papers and things of that nature that we get celebrated for, um, but we struggle um, to really capture them forever in a different kind of way. And I thought we have these really beautiful, robust stories of Black women. Um, they need to live on forever. And doing that um, in a documentary has allowed for that to take place. Um, and so the last thing is uh, kind of like personal stories and personal narratives. Like we have been digging into Black women's experiences with various forms of racism and sexism um, and their autobiographical reflections um, of their time at the University of Denver. Um, I want to echo something that all of the researchers who have been on the team have said. Um, that it's very interesting to hear and see how the realities of Black women at DU are not evolving at the University of Denver. So we're hearing the same rhetoric um, and it just looks a little bit different, right? So what does that mean and what does that tell us about what the system needs to start shifting? in order for us to have better experiences and better realities. Um, and I think we all agree that we hope that this project can shed some light on how DU can better support um, Black women. Um, and I'll just say this, it's been really interesting for me. Um, I got to interview my mother for this project who graduated from DU in the early 2000s. So even having that legacy experience has been very insightful. Um, 
so yes, that is my segment. I'm grateful to be here um, and to see all of our synergies of all the team. Um, and I will give it and pass it to Stevie. I'm Stevie Gunter. My pronouns are they, them. And I'm a research assistant uh, who was invited into the Seeking Grace team in late 2019 while earning a master's in library and information science at DU. I'm currently an archivist librarian at Blair Caldwell, African-American research library as well. Prior to attending DU, while on a tour, um, I entered the Anderson Academic Commons and I see the, Se the Seeking Grace exhibit on the second floor, which really stuck with me and characterized who I felt DU represented, although that later piece uh, wasn't quite the case. Regardless, my mentor Kate connected me with the project and with Kalia and Rachel in continuing to develop it over the past two years. Um, memory is collective and offers us a shape for what our lives mean and how we seek to define it in relation to other various power structures and in relation to each other. We participate in constructing our world by sharing our stories. Seeking and amplifying stories outside of the dominant white narrative challenges what we count as knowledge. And in this way, archives are dynamic and dialectical. When searching archives, we approach from a place of desire. We take into consideration what we want to find how we expect to find it, how we feel about what isn't there, and what is often mischaracterized from our positionality. The queer theory of disidentification helps us transcend that binary between what is and what isn't recorded. It gives us agency in shaping the record and sometimes actively refusing to participate within its limits because we know how truth exists in ourselves and in our experiences. It exists in modes of communication which are historically undervalued by white, imperialist, exploitative, patriarchal institutions, such as the archives. This agency allows for us to subjectively reflect at the intersections of the personal, the cultural, and the scholarly. The contradiction and the complexity of shared narratives shows us how the archives become subjects themselves. Multiple collaborators make meaning and establish knowledge via archives. The structure of the archives lend themselves to invitation or rejection simultaneously. They're transformative spaces. Interacting with, recording, and addressing the record using oral histories literally has the subjects speaking for themselves. This enables a condition where archival desire and resistance means voicing ourselves into the record. The combination of form, oral history, and genre autobiography creates a counter memory discourse, which challenges the memory erasing practices of the institution. Here, the sense of contradiction and complexity can arise. We understand the record to be expansive and culturally divergent because it's always been. Oral history is historically delegitimized de as a means of communicating knowledge and sharing truths in favor of the written word. But Black feminism has taught us that challenging our processes of arriving at truth is imperative. It also has taught us that we must be advocates of our own materials and knowledges by using the power of dialogue. As we name and make real the stories of those excluded from the record, we bring in authenticity as researchers who have also shared the experience of that institutional silence. Our work is made meaningful and powerful through that recognition, but the necessary move towards actionable change doesn't stop with inclusion into the historic record. And for that piece, I'll pass it back to you. I could listen to you all talk all day long. I'm, kind of, I'm so sad that this is just an hour. Um. So I just want to end us um, with a call to action. I think um, everybody who's already spoken has said has said this um, probably better than I, I can and, and will. Um, but I think um, one of the things that I would like to sort of um, close us out with is to think about um, supporting um, through funding this kind of research, because I think it's important to note that until 2017, when we got um, a substantial grant from IRISE, um, the project had been done on essentially bootstrap and a shoestring. Um, and I think, you know, this, this is really important work and it's really important work that deserves um, structural support and funding um, that, uh, and the work needs to center and validate these kind of epistemologies or ways of knowing um, that uh, as, as all of the research team have noted are typically not, uh, centered and uplifted in the academy. Um, I think also, and this is I think especially important since uh, the 
um, the white lady on the panel is going to say it, that the labor can't and should not be entirely on black women. Um, and the people who are doing the work um, should uh, always be accountable to and center black women. That is that has always been a personal goal of mine. It has also been, you know, not something that I've uh, certainly been uh, amazing at all the time, but I think that that's a central value to um, especially this kind of work happening at a PWI. Um, if there are people on the project who are not um, members of the community that the research is centering, that that needs to be accountable to that community, in this case, Black women. Um, that structural supports for Black students, uh, faculty, and staff are really critical to this work throughout this project. And I think this goes back to what Kalia was talking about. We had lots of examples of um, alums who had said, okay, I guess I'll do it because there was not a structural support for um, those students that existed. And so they just made it themselves um, or community members made it themselves. Um, so I think um, knowing and, and seeing that um, <laughs> it's important that, that those structural supports that are consistent and sustainable um, exist. I think also that this project, um, the important thing of, I think central about this project is that black women are not a monolith, that the goal of the project is to say that we can't stop at the, the, the firsts, that we need to, um, the project aims to sort of document and uplift and celebrate this kind of rich diversity of blackness and black womanhood that's present in DU and Denver's history. Um, and I think finally that there is no and can be no reconciliation without truth. The, the project's goal I think fundamentally is about truth telling and um, testimonials that are documented and can and should be heard so that the, the their secondary goal of making the institution accountable, um, in this case, specifically to black women um, uh, is possible. So I, um, Kelly is asking a really great question, which since I'm talking, I will attempt to answer and then uh, I'll open it up to other folks. So Kelly's asking, um, Considering the call to action, what attention have you received in regards to this project by upper administration? Have there been continued funding dedicated towards it? Um, so the two pockets of funding, I'll say three, um, are IRIS grants, um, which we got around 20 grand from IRIS for two years, which was great. Um, a small um, $8,800 grant from Mortgage. Um, and then um, some funding from the university library's budget, but it's been very much cobbled together. Um, and I think that that's something that um, is a very DU thing. DU likes to kind of cobble together um, uh, internal, small internal grants um, for projects like this. And I think that that's a problem. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to say more about that. And then since we are now at the um, Q&A and wrap up section, I don't know, since I'm not the host, I'm not sure how to unmute and start other people's video. So we definitely want other folks to weigh in on this. I can see you now, Kalia. I'm assuming you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you pretty much covered it. I think I will say, honestly, this project has been a push and pull with the institution. Um, I think it's important to note that truth telling and exposing is not always celebrated in the way that it should be because it's also exposing um you know some ugly truths about the university um so i would say that with that um yeah <laughs> folks have not wanted to do their part to keep this project going because they have not wanted those truths to come out um but now everybody's anti-racist so i guess we can um <laughs> tap into that well, I also think that there are other organizations, um, including um, Spencer's small and large grant, um, maybe even the Kellogg Foundation, um, AAUW, which is like American Association of American Women University. Like there are other foundations, I think that would be highly interested in this project. Sometimes it's about going outside of the institution and finding money and then coming back to have a conversation to see about like matching. Um, I know that a lot of people here on Vanderbilt's campus, they do that kind of thing. And that's something that I've learned um, while being here. 
Uh, be, but it's definitely important work and I can guarantee you people will fund it. So um, I don't think that, you know, sticking to DU, not, not that you guys are, I'm just saying, look outside of the University of Denver, um, you know, if you wanna continue to, to do this work. Anybody else wanna weigh in on support that they would like to see the university provide? Um, I think Mia, there's a question also from Mia Ballard that I know um, Kalia answered in Q&A, but I wanted to open it up for anybody else. Um, advice, what advice does this panel have for current DU students who want to start or get involved in research that highlights um, people, perspectives of people of color? Um, so I guess one of the things that I would say is if you identify, if you do not identify with the community that you would like to research with, um, it's super important for um, those folks to really do a deep critical reflection about why. Why are you interested in this and that particular type of work? And I say that because as someone who's like um, in STEM, um, there's a lot of researchers that are getting money, um, lots and lots of money researching black children um, and you know, getting fame and all those kinds of things. And yet they don't have a black friend or they don't support other black researchers. Um, and I just call that out because, you know, People who do identify as black and you know black women in particular, like there's a um, a constant um, you know tension around doing this work, um, and it's not to say that just because you're black you're going to approach research in a humanizing way. So let's not get that twisted. Um, I just want to say that I think it's important for people to really understand your why. Why are you doing this research? So that's my basically top one advice. Um, and then if you have, you know, been able to answer that, then I would just really try to do the most humanizing work that you can, work that elevates voices, work that is going to push back on hegemonic systems, structures, and ideologies, um, and do the work with integrity and, um, you know, uh, be bold with it. Um, so, I'll, I'll let other people jump in, but that's where I would start. I'd like to add, um, in addition to Kalia's advice, as far as reaching out to faculty um, with whom we can collaborate, I think documenting is paramount. Um, as was mentioned earlier in this presentation, we, we come to the projects um, of diversifying our histories by documenting ourselves and recognizing that our, what we bring to um, the record is going to be different um, as an individual, but as a shared experience, there's still that sense of um, needing a nuance to any given project really. And I think by way of existing um, in this project here, speaking from experience, there is just a perspective that you can bring um, through you know, constantly documenting your own experience. And um, in my case, just finding ideologies that uh, can help you expand upon uh, existing research and existing narratives. I think just to add to that, I would say like finding community in all of this as well is very important, be it like other students or like faculty mentors. Um, I would say when I was an undergrad, that's what really got me interested in research is like, oh, I was in like ethnic studies and sociology and we created communities of students that wanted to get into the research realm and then found faculty to kind of guide us through it. So like really just finding the folks who are engaging in the work in meaningful ways and um I don't know like bogarting into those spaces is very important as well. Kate if there are um there's not a while well, we're waiting for another question I just want to say it's lovely to meet Patricia and Rachel and Stevie and Elizabeth because I didn't get to meet uh these students um during my time there 
And so just thank you for the labor, emotional and physical um, labor that you have put into this project. Um, like I said at the beginning, it's such a joy to see how the work has grown and expanded. So um, it's so wonderful to meet all of you. I'm just so glad that you could join us because um, I, I definitely, again, wanted to make sure that um, I feel like I talk about you a lot and I don't want to like make you be in spaces that are going to take up more of your time because I know you're trying to get tenure and I don't want to distract from that. <laughs> um, but I just I'm so grateful to uh, have been your colleague and continue to be able to be your colleague, even though you're not at DU anymore. Yeah, well, the good thing is I'm under review right now. I should know something in about four months. So how about y'all make sure you send the prayers, uh, you know, this way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay, it's, um, yeah, it, it was, I mean, it was a wonderful ride. And again, I just thank you for continuing um, to find it important, um, you know, and to use, you know, your resources, power, privilege, all of those good things to actually you know, uh, co-advance, if you will, you know, this work. Uh, I do, I think, again, especially since DU is a, a very white, predominantly white institution, um, as a white person doing, you know, racial justice work, it, that, that accountability piece is not in there by accident. I think um, the reason that this project came about is because of our relationship, Dr. Joseph. And I think that, um, the relational piece of this kind of work is like, it has to be hard work or it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that hard work is really hard, like relational, especially re relationships um, that are multicultural, multicultural cross-racial um, are, are challenging because we live in a white supremacist culture. And, um, but they're necessary. And if, if, um, white people in predominantly white institutions cannot show up in ways that are accountable to communities of color, it, it's just gonna continue to perpetuate um, those kinds of issues. Um, and, and that's not to say that, you know, I haven't fucked up and I won't continue to fuck up. I think that's, but that's the, that's the point is white supremacy culture wants you to be perfect. And there, there is not perfect in this work. There is relationship and there is accountability and there is hard work though. Um, I see we're coming up on one. Um, does anybody have any last thoughts they want to add? See y'all next week at the premiere, I believe. There you go. It is next week. <laughs> um, it's been nice. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's been nice to see everyone in the space together for the first time. I don't think we've ever been here. Um, and I will make sure I'm going to send an email a little bit later to make sure that everybody gets the link for the documentary pr premiere um and we invite all of the participants as well um and i look forward to seeing y'all on the other side thank you so much and then i think we're are we going to wrap up with the odi staff Is that yes right? thank you so much um that was an incredible panel i want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists and as was just mentioned the seeking grace documentary will premiere next week on march 4th and we will upload the link to, the, to that uh, on our Canvas page for this event. Uh, as a final reminder, for those of you who joined us live today, you'll receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for our next panel on Monday, where we will be discussing the renaming session of the Diversity Summit. Thank you all again and have a great rest of your day.